All right, Golf WRX. It's Johnny Wonder. This is a, I think I'll call it a prototype video pod. Um, Want to do this for a little while. And I am uh, with something I'm a huge fan of that I've been kind of stalking on Instagram. A young man named Logan Olson who has a company called the Logan Manufacturing or Logan MFG, I think it is, on Instagram. And he's a young artist, putter maker, miller out of Fortuna, California. Logan, there you are. Show us your face. What's going on? How's it going? <laughs> Doing good. Okay, so, you know, I know who you are. So tell everybody else who you are, where you came from, just what's going on over there. Yeah, I mean, basically, I just have a little bit of a background in golf and uh, a big interest in, like, mechanical engineering. And so the, the two things sort of led me to this position where I get to make putters all day. Okay, so who inspires you? Uh, you know, I think I pull inspiration from almost everybody. You know, we've all got our own sort of sense of style, and, and I think we can all appreciate everybody's skill set. And uh, I don't know if anybody's the, the, the master of all things in the trade, but there's definitely people that – really chime in and can be really good at certain aspects. And so I mean, you try to pull inspiration from everybody you can in, in the in just, you know, design world. And it doesn't even have to be putter makers, you know, like car designers or, or I mean, even clothing designers, you know, you can pull inspiration from all kinds of places. Right. Okay. So, you know, the, the business that you chose to get into and you're young, I mean, you're 20, 21, 22 years old, right? So, you know, you chose a business that now has become pretty competitive, which is the, the, the bespoke custom you know, higher priced golf business. So, sure. you know, there's talented guys out there. Tyson Lamb, Noah from Strokes Gain, Mike Taylor and those boys from Artisan. I mean, I can go on and on with a list, but what makes you stand out? What are you doing differently? Is it, is it your personal touch? Is it how you mill? Like what, what makes the Logan Olsen brand different? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is, is just being able to have a personal connection, you know, and I, and I really try to do my absolute best, obviously, you know, I can kind of run a one man show here and, and so it's hard, but you know, I try to really dedicate as much time as I possibly can to build personal connections with clients. You know, it's not far fetched to have phone conversations with every putter I make and, and back and forth email threads and messages and, and photos, you know, and I just I try to do the best to build the most personal customer relationship I can and, and give them the best product, the best quality of product I possibly can because at the end of the day, you know, it's the product that matters, but it's the sort of the face that you can put to your business and the approach you can have working with people that really sort of define the way you do business. Right. Which is the, which is, which is the challenge. Cause all the guys that I know that do, that are doing what you're doing is there's only one of you, right. And there's, there's only, only one person that does what you do. And obviously you want to make money, you want to get your name out there. So it's, there's a real fine line between balancing, doing too much, not doing yeah. enough, putting too much in, you know, cause the rules still apply 24 hours in a day and seven days in a week. You know, yeah, there's only so many hours you can spend. I mean, I'm, I'm here about 100 hours a week and, and you know, and it's like it's not enough. And, and so it's hard, you know, finding, finding the time. It, it's, there's only so much time in the day, like you said. So it's, it's difficult, but, you know, you just do the best you can and, and hope that people can be understanding and, and do your best to deal with people. And what's your main distribution channel as of right now, Instagram, as far as marketing is concerned? Is that where people are getting the most? Yeah, I mean, I, I, try, to, I try to spend a decent amount of time being a uh, regular posting through Instagram. I think it's important. I think a lot of people who are really interested in this sort of a world, you know, it's, it's sort of the, the newer stream of business is being able to have a connection through a media avenue. And, and Instagram has been really powerful. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a photo based system where you know you could you could have a little bit of, of information but mostly it's a photo um and being in the world we're in today you know you can have a photo that you've taken of a part you've made here in just in northern california and and, and somebody in great britain or somebody in, in canada or, or you know new york texas anywhere kind of see your stuff and that's pre that's pretty powerful being able to have that outreach and that exposure without having to really dump a ton of money into like uh you know advertising or anything like that it's huge right okay so Really quickly before we get it, because you were in your shop. That's the cool thing about doing the video pod is we're actually in your you know, 2,400 square foot kind of workshop. Yeah, this is my office right here. Nothing, nothing too fancy, but it, it gets the job done. And it's, it's my space where I can design and, and feel comfortable and, and put a lot of hours. Right. Okay. So, you know, we'll get to, to the advice you can give to other people that want to get into what you're doing. But what's your schooling background? Like, where did you learn your trade? Yeah, I mean, I was previous to this. Um, 
obviously I went through high school and, and I was going to a local JC and I was basically sort of majoring in mechanical engineering. Um, and so I had sort of a background in drafting from high school. Um, and it was more along the lines of sort of like a building drafting, like AutoCAD work for like houses and stuff. And then it sort of transformed into the 3D modeling space. Um, when this new software was coming out, uh, Fusion 360 is an Autodesk product. Um, and it sort of interested me enough to get involved into it. And I sort of got into the putter design by happenstance in a weird sort of scenario. And, and it ended up being a project that I was helping my, my younger brother out on, but it ended up sort of transitioning into almost an obsession of being able to, to make these kind of parts. And, and that's basically where my background comes is having a little bit of background in modeling and drafting and mechanical engineering to some degree and, and being able to sort of learn on the fly. And I had the opportunity to apprentice under a machinist for about a year and a half. And that was huge to kind of grow my skill set as a machinist because there's a lot of things to learn and, and being able to learn it on your own is very time consuming. And so having somebody who can sort of help you along the way and sort of push you and motivate you is, is huge. I think that's really important for putting me in the position I am today. Well, it's also, it's also, you know, an awesome thing because, you know, in this day and age, you go into college for four years and doing that and figuring out what you're going to do with the rest of your life after that is cool. But being able to make some mistakes and try some new things and, you know, at your age, uh, which is something I'll encourage my kids to do. Like if you love something, get into it and get in big. Um, Absolutely. Because you never know, right? And some of the stuff you can't learn in school and it's not good, don't go to school. It's not the message. It's just that you know, you never know what you're going to get good at. So be careful what you yeah, get. I mean, exactly. I think you hit it on the head. I mean, it's like, you know, when, when you're, when you're, if you're going to be motivated enough and you're going to be able to put in the time, you know, you've also got the time to sort of make mistakes on your own speed and if, if you're you know really interested in doing something that day and you're not worried about making mistakes you can make as many mistakes as you want you know you're on your clock you're on your timeline and, and I think as far as you know someone who's really interested in growing their skill set the biggest thing you can do is just sit down and do it I mean that's that's basically all it is 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 investing the time and understanding that you know it's not going to be perfect ever but it's not going to be you know close to perfect the first the second the third it's, it's putting in the hours and you really only have something that works when you've done it, you know, the wrong way, every other, every, every other way, you know, you, there's only one right way, I guess, but there's a lot of a million ways to do it wrong. And that helps you right. get on the path towards the right direction. Yeah. Okay. So we're in your workshop. So you give us, give us the grand tour. It's the first gear dive, uh, workshop tour of all time. Sure, yeah. I mean, this, is my, this is my office. This is where I do a lot of my modeling. And so my CAD CAM, basically my, my computer drawing, um, and then my, into my programming, this is an integrated software where it's got CAD CAM in one setup. So basically, you can see sort of a list of tool paths for a cutter here. And I can run a simulation on the on the desktop here, sort of what's going on. But basically, what we're looking at is sort of like a preview of what's going to happen for a putter head. And so you can see a quick simulation of basically everything that's going to be going on at the machining center after I've spent, you know, hundreds of hours into drafting it and adjusting programming and everything. And so this is sort of a quick preview before I go to make sure everything's in the right place and you don't crash the machine. And then I'll take this file, this program, and I'll load it on the machining center so we can walk out there. This is sort of my like, shipping area where I'll box up parts and, you know, cutters and boxes and head covers and whatnot. And on a regular basis, these will go out to the postal service and get sent out to people all over the world. Here's the main shop area, a couple buckets of chips from parts I was running this week. Uh, walked around here, some cutters that are in progress, some plumbing necks, a couple different style heads, some that have just got the slot mortise cut for the necks in them that are ready to go. Okay. I have a, I have a question for you. Yeah, absolutely. My buddy Jeff Halverson's a big, a big, you know, gearhead. He's a guy who's okay. been, been on my, been on my podcast before and he's, He's into the whole bespoke game. Like, you know, he's got parts from everybody. So okay. he would come to you particularly and want a long neck putter, you know, like an answer style long neck. Is that something you could pull off? It's a hard one to do, but. It, it is a hard one to do. And, and basically what it comes down to is fixturing. You know, putter necks are extremely difficult pieces to make. They're very uh, geometric in shape, but they have a lot of compound angles. And, and the biggest battle you fight with machining is sort of having rigid setups. And so basically, you know, anytime you're making a part, like this is an example of a part I've been doing a lot of one-off putters lately where there's, you know, custom head weights, custom designs, a lot of that kind of stuff. And so right now I've got the machine set up with vices, but a lot of the time I'll have fixtures in the machine. So something along the lines of this where, you know, I've got a specific part that I've made to hold parts in a specific orientation. 
in order to machine certain features, you know. And so something, what would seem as simple as like a plumbing net, you know, at first glance, it's a pretty simple part. But the reality of it is, is it's, you know, a part that starts off as a big billet and then it's machined in one operation, then it's taken out, it's reoriented, it's put in a fixture, it's machined in a second operation, taken out, reoriented, put in an additional fixture, machined, taken out, reoriented into a fourth fixture. And so there's a ton of time that's invested into just the thinking about how do I hold, how do I hold this, you know? And so long necks are, are very complicated in the sense that, you know, it, it requires a very specific sort of fixturing setup for it along with the, the stock, you know, has to be accommodated in order for the part to nest inside of it. So I've done a couple long necks. I've done some really long ones, um, but they're, they're definitely trickier than your average putter neck. See, I, I, I hear that and I hear, uh, I hear just added, added cost, added time. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, that's the thing is basically what it comes down to is, is, you know, it's a, it's a whole redraw. It's a whole reprogram. It's, I got to make the parts, hold the part to make the part. I got to program those parts. And so it ends up being a huge investment in time along with, you know, setting up the machine and, and ordering specific stock and sometimes even specialized tooling to reach certain features. Um, you know, and so it's like I have array of, an array of tooling I use on a regular basis, all the way from like big roughing tools to chamfer tools to ball end mills. And then, you know, even in the machine, you know, shell mills and, you know, multiple different flute styles in order to accommodate and machine certain features. And so they're very involved as far as the, uh, machining aspect goes is doing those custom parts and that's what adds to the cost and sometimes it's hard to explain that to people you know they ask for something very specific and it's hard to explain why it's cost that much but the reality of it is it's just there's that much time invested in it you know it's it's just there's that much out that many hours and that's what makes it so expensive right well there you go jeff he's gonna ask there you go that's for, how, <laughs> look for you jeff Howardson. um okay so give us some examples of some of your work so obviously you can go to instagram and see the pictures but uh to have the creator kind of hold them up and, and kind of explain yeah. it a bit. Um, I got a couple. I got a couple putters that are sort of in progress, and a few that are, you know, gripped and shafted that are in my office right now. So you kind of take a take a look at a couple of those. Um, you know, basically, you, know, you make the part, you make the putter head, and then you obviously you're going to shaft it and grip it, etc. So here's an example of a putter that I just recently finished. And um, this is up on my Instagram account right now. But basically, this is a pretty involved sort of sort of like a tier three putter in sense where it's got a lot of customization you know a twisted plumbing neck hand stamp welded neck welded rails chrome polished wow. all over the place and so this one's pretty involved um, it's a lot of hours that have been dumped into this you know this this abalone you know it's machined it's programmed it's inlaid there's fasteners in here that are threaded that kind of seal the the two pieces together and then you know just certain things like that or, or, or what can, you know, add to the cost or adjust the customization ability, you know, something like this, same thing. You know, this is a five piece head where you've got, you know, a head and then three pieces of a neck and then an inlay as well for the sight dot. So this is a pretty involved piece as well. What's a, a couple examples of that. Give me an example. Of something, give me an example of something general, like, like something that's not sure, yeah, like, sort of like, like a stock option. Yeah. Yeah, so this this would be more along the lines of something more stock, you know, and I can actually grab one right here. So this one is more or less what you'd be looking at for sort of a stock option. This one in particular has got like a chromatic bronze finish, so it's been torched, but basically, you know, it's just, it's a simple head, not a lot of customization. It's got a single sight line. Um, let's go over here so you can see just a little bit better. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's got the logo and everything, and it's just a really clean option. And something like this is going to come into more of my uh, consumer grade putters and the, the cost goes considerably down. And so I try to make them as available as I can to anybody. And, and something like this, you know, this is going to be about a $450 putter, but they range in price starting from, you know, about 345 bucks. And so I do the best I can to try to make them available to somebody who's interested enough to spend a little bit, but, you know, not have the, two to three thousand dollar bill that's associated with an ultra custom one right okay what kind of components are you using for the folks at home i know what you use but tell everybody else kind of, you know what shafts and grips you're, you're uh, prone to using yeah I, right now I, i've gotten really big into um buying from uh, master grips and these ones that are in particular ones i carry in stock all the time and they're genuine kangaroo leather um they're handmade uh, they they have just an excellent feel to them they're ultra plush super soft I um, mean, they're just, they're hard to beat. And so I've been ordering these, you know, hundreds at a time. And, and I also carry in stock like gator skin and, and uh, snake skin. And uh, I'll do like uh, ostrich leg 
leather and all kinds of stuff. And so just depending on what people want to spend or are interested in having, you know, the, there's availability to order all these ultra custom materials, which makes it a lot of fun. You know, it's not something you normally see. You don't, you don't go to a, a shelf in your, in your pro shop and pick off a, you know, a big name or company putter and, and have it have a, you know, handmade grip on it. It's just, it's an added touch side that is really nice. Give me an example of something that's a little bit different than like an answer. I mean, do you have a, do you have a putter there that's a, maybe a little bit more of a, of a blade style, like even more blade style than a ping answer? Or do you, give me another Yeah, example. something like this, you know, is going to come in as kind of what you're talking about. This is my retro head if you want to get term, terminal with us. But basically, this is a two-piece head that's been blend welded together. So you get some better lighting so you can see. That's yeah, beautiful. Um, so it's got some chrome features on it and things like that. And, and basically, this is a two-piece head that's been filler welded and blended into one piece. So it's got a lot, very super custom, but uh, ends up coming out really, really nice, you know, super clean. It's like a, it's a, a style of putter like David Toms would use back in exactly, the day. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. And as far as your interaction, you know, the tour is always something that moves the needle, especially for you creators. You know, if you can get something in the hands of a player that's out there in the big show, um, it obviously helps business. So. Where are you at with all that kind of stuff? Is that part of the part of the model is to get you know some players to use it? Do you push that at all? So talk to me a little bit about that. I don't I don't particularly push it. I think it's great when you know you get players like tour players or, or aspiring pros or college players or web.com. It's awesome. I've gotten the the pleasure and 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 you know to work with them in the past. I mean they give me some really awesome feedback. I don't I don't particularly say that my model of business would be to push to these players. Um, but it's been a lot of fun with the people I have been able to work with in the past. And they've got such a vast knowledge and a very sort of specific idea what they want and being able to accommodate to what they want and, and sort of have the tolerances to sort of make it happen is, is a lot of fun. And they're very tricky sometimes, but it, it's always worth it in the end. You know, they, they're the ones that are out there, you know, using these things to make their money and, and they're the experts and, and they, you know, they're the first ones I want to talk to for feedback because they give the best feedback in the world. You know, who better to talk to than a touring professional and a putter? Um, are you, um, are you, like, I mean, have you had any instances where people that you just, you know, people called you or contacted you? Because I'm assuming that you're, you're, you have putters or at least being tried by players from all the tours, not just, you know, certain ones, but I'm assuming most of them have reached out. Have you had any instances where somebody reached out and you're like, oh my God, that person, you don't have to name any names, but oh my God, that person's pretty famous. Like, that's crazy. Yeah, I, I've actually, I just recently had that happen and it's, it's pretty wild, you know, just to think that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really young and, and I, I like to think of myself as relatively humble. And so it's, it's pretty neat for me, someone who's, you know, been in the golf world, you know, since I was really young, like six years old. And, and you know, you basically grow up idolizing these guys on TV, you know, you almost associate sort of a, uh, a godly level with them, you know, and, and then that's just more and more realized, you know, you go to tour events as you get older and you get to watch them play and man, these guys are just really good. And there's just no way around it. They're just phenomenal. And so when you get the chance to sort of have them reach out to you and ask you questions or be willing to work with you, it's, it's a, it's an amazing experience. And I, and I hold it really high um, sort of as far as, you know, it goes for me, you know, I, I really take a lot of gravity to that situation. And so it's, it's just, it's fun for me. It's a lot of fun. So, you know, where do we find you? So somebody wants to order a putter, walk us, you know, this is kind of, we're going to wrap this up, but like, yeah. talk to me a little bit about the process. Somebody calls you, reaches okay. out to you, how, and then what, what can they experience and then and what's the turnaround time? Yeah, so right now, a lot of, a lot of people uh, end up contacting me through my Instagram account, um, Olson MFG, that's short for manufacturing. And so basically, they'll, they'll either send me an instant message or like a request for a message and they'll be like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm interested in a putter. And what I'll end up doing is I'll route them to my website um, and then I'll have them fill out a customs form. And basically that's just a way for me to sort of get all their information, get an idea of what they're looking for, have their specs, you know, how many degrees upright are you? How many degrees flat are you? Do you need extra lock on the face? Do you need extra length on the shaft? Do you want a really short shaft? Um, what kind of customization are you looking for? And that gives me a pretty good idea of, of what I would quote a build price at. Obviously, you know, they're, they change in price from putter to putter. There's certain things that, are uh, very labor intensive with certain ones and certain things that aren't. And so the prices are going to range per putter. Um, having somebody fill out a form gives me for one, a reference sheet down the road. So if I, you know, had a question that I couldn't remember, I can call and, and reference into their, their uh, order sheet. And it's easy for me to pull numbers. And so I'll fill out a custom request form. 
I'll get back to them as soon as I can within a couple of days normally um, with sort of like, a, hey, you know, this is what you're looking at as far as price wise. This is what you're looking at as far as lead time goes. You know, if there's specific materials involved, obviously the, the lead time can increase because I'm, I'm, I'd have to order these materials. But on a regular basis right now, I'm taking on custom orders. My lead time is about, you know, four to eight weeks and then five to eight weeks just depending. Okay. And, um, you know, what's, what's the end game here? So obviously you want to grow, you want to make a bunch of putters, but you're one human being in one shop. So, right. you know, and you're young. So I'm, I'm assuming that the sky's the limit, but is the idea to continue to build this up, get it going. And then, you know, as you get older, maybe teach somebody else your ways and, and build a team around you. And is that kind of the idea or do you like just being a lone wolf? I mean, I, I like, I like the aspect of, of doing it. Uh, I guess, as you could say, lone wolf, just because at the end of the day, the responsibility is on my shoulders if a, if a problem arises or anything like that. And, and I know, you know, exactly what I did and I know the solution to solve it, or I know the best route to do it. And having somebody in the shop that could help out is a really powerful resource as far as growing the business. But being able to be one of these sort of bespoke putter companies, sort of like a boutique style company, you know, I think that there's a lot of uh, validity to being able to work hand in hand and go back and forth with the guy who's making your product. You know, I think it's pretty, it's a special thing to, you know, be able to invest in sort of, it's almost like a piece of functional art. You can work back and forth with somebody and say, Hey, you know, this is what I'm interested in doing. Bounce a few ideas around. And, and I, I like, I like to say that I probably want to maintain that sort of a business model as long as possible and, and keep it, you know, relatively small in the sense where I can still have that personal connection. I can still have that personal touch. I, I, I would hate to have it turn into something where it would be sort of a mass produced product. I like being able to have that personal feedback and that uh, connection with my clients. Okay. Last question. If you could build a putter for one person out there, who would you build it for? Oh man, I don't even know. I'd like to say probably Ricky Fowler. I like that guy a lot, um, but I don't know. It's just, it's so hard. There's just too many good people out there, and, and I think I just have a lot of fun working with certain people. Okay. Well, that's Logan Olson, everybody. So you're getting the, kind of the inside look at a young guy making some seriously awesome putters. So uh, Logan will be looking out for you. But, uh, you know, I know the people on Golf WRX, everybody's uh, obviously a bunch of gear junkies, so they'll um, probably get a lot of eyes on you. Um, they, love, they love the custom stuff. So thank you for Sounds giving us you know, 15 or 20 minutes on a, on a busy day. So. We'll talk, to, uh, we'll talk to you soon, my friend. All right. Thanks, Johnny. Appreciate yeah, it. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.